celebrating every aspect of who we are and remembering the work that we still have left to be done. My name is Jay Clapp. My pronouns are she and they. I am the executive director of the LGBTQ Center of Durham, but I'm also known as Vivica C. Cox, Durham's drag diva, a social justice drag queen and matriarch of the House of Cox, which has been around for eight years now. I'm from Roxborough, a small town of about 9,000 people. I actually grew up on the land on which my family was enslaved. I was raised to believe that to whom much is given, much is expected. And while I didn't grow up with much other than a heart and a brain and a charming personality, I, I learned that with those, because I have brain and I have heart and I have personality in abundance, it's my role to share it. While I love who I am and I love the way I look, society has told me I shouldn't. And somehow I still rose to prominence and figured out a way to be present in this community without fitting societal standards of beauty. And that feels really powerful. And I don't think it would have happened if I had not grown up in a slightly homogenous community that told me it was okay to be me even if they didn't always understand what it meant to be LGBTQ+. I do remember when I brought someone home for the first time, it wasn't my mother, it was my great aunt. She was just confused. She was confused and I've never forgotten that. I first did drag in 2001. I was a junior in high school um, at the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics. And at the end of the year, there was always a competition called Air Band, which was a lip syncing competition. And people dared me as a light skinned black person with a red fro to do an artist called Macy Gray. And I went up there by myself and I stood at a, at a microphone and I performed this ballad in front of a room of parents and families and students in 2001 as a black queer kid, as a woman. Killed it. I killed it. And so I did amateur drag for about 12 more years. And then in 2013, I was sitting at the pinhook with a friend, owner of the pinhook, looks at us and goes, do you any, know any local drag queens? And I said, what do you need? And they said, well, we have Manila Luzon from RuPaul's Drag Race, and we need someone to open for her. And I said, I can do it. But this is when I actually figured out who Vivica was. Someone goes, like, who do you want to be in drag? And I said, I want to feel as sexy as Vivica A. Fox. And I love the way she talks about her name. She always says, because Vivica is A. Fox. And like, her name is Honey, because her name is Vivica A. Fox. Vivica is A. Fox. A. And I was like, I want to have something like that when I talk about my drag. And they were like, so what's a play on Vivica Fox? And I was like, uh, Vivica Fox, Vivica Cox. Oh my God, there it is. So I get on the mic and I'm funny. I perform and I'm talented. And the crowd went wild and they loved me. And the owner of the pinhook said, you come up with a concept and you can host your own shows here. And I said, well, damn. I personally think that drag is activism, is an expression, is art, is church. I think drag is church. I think people come to drag shows to get their souls filled. And I think that it is community, and I think it is love, and I think it can also be problematic, and we would be naive to not name that. 
The members of the House of Cox are all people who were not welcome in spaces at some point in time. We all have multiple marginalized identities that make it impossible for us to fit in everywhere we go. And so we decided to be the voice for the people who look like us, and that requires to be activists. And we do our shows the way we do, because we've been out before. We know that not every bar and club is safe, and we know that not always is a drinking establishment, a place that understands the importance of body politics. And we're mostly all survivors of sexual violence. And so we're just trying to be out there as real humans, setting an, an example of how you can thrive in a community once again. I spent so many years at Duke University focusing on how can I help those who need it most, right? So given the opportunity to serve more marginalized people, people who are struggling with housing security, food security, access to healthcare, transportation, I couldn't miss that opportunity. But helping serve marginalized identities is what I do. Because if someone wouldn't have helped me, where would I be? But transitioning to be the ED, I came in wanting to create a fully functioning organization that provided services to the community while also being rooted in social justice and being um, and uplifting the voices of those who are most marginalized among us. And I think we did that. We have a youth center. We have housing programs, domestic violence and sexual assault programs, gender programs. So yeah, it's been a journey and a process and I'm glad that I was on it. Parts of my story made me commit to making sure that other kids knew that it was okay to come out and to grow and to thrive. And that's why it was so important for me to take over Pride when it was failing and it needed new ownership. I wanted to see the LGBTQ Center of Durham revive it. And I'm glad that I was a part of that process because there are little kids just waiting for an opportunity to be who they are. And Pride festivals, as controversial as they can be across this nation, tell little kids it's okay. There are people who are happy and thriving and have puppies and jobs. And are just good to go. And they're just like you. North Carolina has an interesting queer history. Because we have visionaries and leaders like Pauli Murray, who arguably was our first trans Episcopal priest ever. But Durham was the home of the first um, protest march and pride festival in North Carolina. When I was in high school, I remember that same pride festival happening right in front of me and the magic of being able to witness folks do that. I also remember North Carolina being one of those places that felt progressive. But it just seems like everything kept going downhill for queer people. On my heart today are people like Jazz Leon Castro, who isn't in the National Registry of uh, people who were murdered um, this year uh, because she died by herself. That this was somebody who was moving to Charlotte and wanted to live back in North Carolina to be with her family and couldn't. Because of transphobia, because of stigma, I'm thinking of Johanna Medina, who is somebody who is not in the National Registry of trans people who have died because she was killed by ICE. She was abandoned at a hospital when her HIV diagnosis accelerated to the point of an AIDS diagnosis. She was left to die at a hospital. person who holds the second highest office in this state and reportedly hopes to be elected governor of North Carolina has repeatedly and unapologetically spewed loads of rhetoric 
toward the LGBTQ plus community without any apparent regard for the very real possibility that his statements could incite more violence toward all of us. HB2, Amendment 1, all of this legislation to criminalize, marginalize queer identity. I think it was 2012 that Amendment 1 happened and I was, you know, phone banking and it was about a year before Vivica was born. And you get kind of fed up and you decide that it's time to go ahead and like jump into um, your own story. And I'm glad I did. Yeah. I just want people to be able to wake up every single day and just be who they know they are. That's it. That's all I hope for. And that's what I work toward.